Hello everyone, my name is Uwais Asmao. Welcome to another episode of Mr. Skip Cat, a show where we talk career experiences, entrepreneurship and investments. The main aim is to show that there's more than one way to be successful other than just climbing the corporate ladder. We are live on LinkedIn and YouTube and the show will be available on podcast by latest tomorrow morning. If you are watching live, please drop a one in the comments and if you're joining us on the recording, please drop a two in the comments. My guest for this week is Peter van der Swan. Chartered Accountant, Associate Professor, and a Tax and IFRS Advisor. Peter, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, Uwais. Nice to be here. To jump straight into questions, tell us your story, uh, where you come from, and maybe outside of work, who is Peter van der Swan? Give us that. Okay. Um, so I grew up in Pretoria. Um, I went to school in Pretoria. And I guess as with all kids, you at some point you start realizing what you're more interested than in other things. So I've re started realizing that it's more business than biology and those kind of things. So I was fortunate enough to then go and study. So I studied at the University of Pretoria um, and I did a BCom, uh, BCom honors and a CTA and then qualified as a, as a CA. And I, I think um, looking back, so even though I'm, I'm working at another university now, I, I, I still love the University of Pretoria. I think it's a, it's a very good institution. Um, I think toward, during my studies, I started realizing that um, what really interests me about all these things that we, that we learn is what really, what sort of the fundamental principles behind it. So not just what the accounting standard says, but why it says that, or not just what the tax law says, but why it says it. So obviously, as you're studying, you don't necessarily have time to go and um, find all those things. So that's basically what I've been doing um, ever since I've completed my studies. So my journey was basically after, after finishing my studies, I went into academia for a year as an academic article clerk or a trainee, um, also at, at, at UP. Then I went into audit practice for the minimum period that I could. So two years and, well, only the two years. Um, and even during that period, I've, I think you will say at KPMG, if I'm not mistaken, so I, I became involved in the, the learning and development um, department there. So I did, I qualified as a trainer and I presented all kinds of of training and updates. And as soon as I finished there, I went to the technical department where I really sort of started finding what I like. It's all these complex problems and where you have to go and understand what the rule says. Um, but at the same time, after about six months of that, um, KPMG had an academy for CTA students. Uh, I, I became involved in that again. So I had this, I was sort of one foot in, in practice one foot in, in academia all along. Um, and after a while, I then joined the Northwest University where I'm, where I'm still involved and where I'm responsible for the master's program in tax. Um, but again, that interest in actually how the, implementing these things in real life uh, remained. So I've, I've been blessed enough over the last 10 years to build up a consulting practice as well. And quite a quite a good strong client base. So in in my view, from a, a, a professional perspective, I view myself as a true hybrid academic slash practitioner. And I think the two complement each other quite well. Um, what you learn on the one side in practice, you can transfer to the students and what you have to what you have to study to be able to present the lectures, you you apply in practice again. So it's not two mutually exclusive um, things. I think as far as outside of all of these things, um, I've, I've realized that life is about a lot more than, than just this. And I think as we all, as we all um, grow and get older, you initially, you, you don't, you're not doing that well at striking that balance. So you, in the beginning, you, you just work and uh, at some point you realize, but you can't do it. It's not, that's not what it's about. So, um, 
I'm trying to keep a bit of a balance and there's a few things that I've learned are probably more important than any business or any job or anything like that. That's the people around you. So uh, I've got a lovely wife and two children and that if you don't spend time with them now, you're probably never going to. Then your I think the other important pillar is your your faith or your religion. You need something to 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 give you purpose to life. And I think the last thing is your health. And we've all probably realized that during during the pandemic is that some things you can't control, but to the extent that you that you can look after your own health, you have to. So um other than this afternoon, my normal routine is is to go at four o'clock, I would put the two kids into the pram and we would go jogging for uh, an hour, hour and a half. So that's basically my my routine. <laughs> no, that's, and I like what you say, you, you, the life is a lot bigger than your job title at work, most definitely. Exactly. Tell me, uh, what made you, I mean, you. I know you work in academia and half in and half out, but what made you specifically specialize in tax? Because that's a that's a specialization all on its own. It's got its own um, specialization. It's got its own things that people aspire to, but you specifically went there. I mean, you could have said, I want to focus on IFRS, which you do a little bit, but tax is the main focus. What, what made you decide to go that way? I think um, when I, when I, as I, I was doing my articles, I did the master's in tax. So I've started to develop a, an interest in a, and a passion for that. And when I moved to the technical accounting department, I started seeing that a lot of these deals that that one would put together, actually the tax and IFRS are both big components of it. And often the tax component would be, well, at that point sounded quite interesting to me. So I've, uh, well, when I went into academia, tax was the opportunity that was available. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have quite a few mentors along the way from a tax perspective to, to help learn the, the trade. Um, I, I guess if you look at IFRS compared to tax, one would probably find that there's, from a client perspective, there's a lot more, um, you've got a much bigger client base in tax than, than in IFRS. Um, so although I, I enjoy IFRS, I, I also like to, and I, I do quite a bit of consulting on IFRS still, but I think if you, if you, if you've got a practice or a consulting um, firm, tax is probably the, 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 the easier or the, the bigger source of work than, than IFRS specifically. Um, I think if you go into accounting and doing books, it's a, it's a bit of a different question, but IFRS advisory is, uh, the, the, the client pool is only so big. I hear you, I hear you. If anybody's got any questions for Peter, please add it to the to the comment section now. We'll deal with all the questions towards the end, but we don't want to miss out on your question. You you mentioned that you, you I mean, you studied in Pretoria, you did your articles in Pretoria, and then I had a quick look on Google Maps and I see Potsdam is like two hours away. So, I mean, it's not even close. Uh, how did you end? end up are you are you still working are you living in pretoria or do you, and do you do zoom or do you are you based in potchefstroom how did you end up there i'm based in potchefstroom um so i think at the time of moving we uh, the the traffic in pretoria was quite hectic they were busy building the the rebuilding the highways for the soccer world cup and things like that so it took you about two hours to get to work and two hours to get back home um, so that's at one of the, the turning points when I realized, but that you can't continue doing that. You, you basically neglect all these other important things in your life. So we, well, what, what between all the different universities that I then started looking at, what was attractive about Potchefstroom was the fact that it's countryside, but not completely out of the, out of the city. So it's about an hour and a half from Joburg, um, the, the students, the lectures, the university atmosphere is here. And um, before COVID, when I went to Joburg once or twice a week to for for consulting work, um, fortunately with Teams and Zoom and those kind of things, I've been able to basically build and expand the the consulting side of it. Um, 
from a, from an online uh, basis. And I think what's also nice about that that I've learned since then is that you this now opens up the rest of the world as well, uh, especially for IFRS consulting. You you don't have to be in whatever country. You can sit there in Potchefstroom, South Africa, and and do all of that work. No, so we're based here. We we like the lifestyle. It's relaxed. Um, you've got time to do the things you want to do. Um, yeah, so I, I guess that's that's the that's the story. <laughs> no, that's amazing. Talk to us a little bit more about the opportunities in the tax field. It's maybe somebody sitting out there who's interested in tax, maybe thinking of taking the next step. How do they know whether the tax whether the, the tax is for them, and uh, what steps should they take? Okay, so I think, um, and uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to do a bit of marketing for our master's program at the university. Go for it. <laughs> so um, maybe let me start at this point. If you if you look at the tax world as far as the consulting, well, you've probably got three streams in which you can end up. One is to do tax in a in a specific business, so to look after the tax affairs of the business, basically be the tax manager of the business. Um, for that, you would you would need uh, a good understanding of of the law. But what I've seen is that most people who who work in that area um, knows the tax law that applies to that business and its and the industry quite well. Um, and that's what what's required of you. So you would have a possibly a, a limited area that you need to know everything where the law could could apply. The the second way to go would be if you look at it more perhaps from a let's call it the traditional accounting firm perspective where you would do tax compliance work, um, filing returns, um, those kind of things. Maybe some of the the simpler disputes, and then the last leg of it would be the let's call it the pure tax advice, planning, structuring, those kind of things. So the one I can give first and um, knowledge on, or that I've got first and knowledge on is the tax advice structuring planning. That's what I do every day. Um, I think it's the one one needs to realize that it is quite complex. You you um, you need to not only understand the tax law, but you need to also have a good feel for or learn how to understand what the business looks like, what the commercial transaction is those kind of things and then of course there's you as you go along you 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 start learning as to what risks would they be involved from a tax perspective so whatever advice you give there's always a risk of possible disputes you have to build some mechanisms to to um to mitigate that risk um i think from the compliance perspective and i can only give you the outsider's view on that but I think the biggest risk there is that within the budget that a client would give you, it's probably quite difficult to go into as much detail as you would ideally like to, as you would, you should perhaps be going. So the nice thing from an advisory perspective is you get an instruction and you drill down into all the depth in that instruction and you make sure you've got all the facts, you, you understand all the small details. If you look at it from a compliance perspective, ideally you should be doing that to every with every line item that that you take from the financial statements to understand exactly what's in there. Um, so I think the the risk there is that because you don't go as deep as you as you would, and it's often the budget that would would be the constraint, you might end up having risks of disputes and those kind of things that would come up where you would probably afterwards think, but I should have maybe thought about this. Um, I think the the other angle on that is it's a volumes game there. You need to have quite a big pool of clients that you look after, and that's where it becomes difficult to, well, you need, if you go that that way, you need to find, again, mechanisms to to make sure that you go into sufficient depth in into the underlying financial statements or the trial balance or whatever you use. Um, I think the the corporate side, what's nice about that is you're working within the team with the business. Um, you you've got the legal people next to you, you've got the CFO, you've you 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 also learn about that specific business and in the industry. Um, 
yeah, I, I guess those are probably the opportunities. Um, I think what you, in my mind, what, what I've also realized along the way is you should find what you like and where you can add value. Um, it's not all about where you can make money. Um, if you, if you, even if you make a lot of money, you can still hate what you're doing and you're probably not going to do it for the next 40 years. So find what you like, um, go for that. And I think also the people that you work with, the people that you meet, that's what's really, what really makes your, your career. Um, the money will come if, if you find the right recipe. No, that's great advice. Definitely, especially uh, find what you like. Because I've worked in places where you've earned a lot, earned a lot of money, but not been happy. So money is not going to make you happy. And just also, uh, you mentioned about the uh, um, the tax compliance portion. Is that you end up going after the low hanging fruit because you can only achieve the things that make that that move the needle a lot with with not too much effort because you don't go into too much detail. It's only going to move it. So again, it depends on what what you're interested in. That's exactly. I'm gonna pivot a little bit. Right. Pivoting a little bit away from tax and onto entrepreneurship. So I mean, you had this job at, at KPMG. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it's a good paying job in a corporate with uh, a, a good potential career t- trajectory. But you still decided to start your own business. We talked about it a little bit, but talk to us a little bit more about why you made that decision. Um. Right. So I, th- I guess it's again. It, it depends on what gives you gives you a bit of a kick if I can say it like that. So um writing opinions where the client didn't really you didn't really build the relationship with the people at the client. It was the client coming to KPMG. Um so they basically came to the corporate irrespective of who who was the person providing the service. Uh, or you you wrote an article and it was this is KPMG's view. Um, so I think I'm more of an individualist than that. I want, if I want to write something, I want to be proud to say that this is what I did. This is, this is me. This is what, these are my views. Um, if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, then it's my mistake. Uh, so I guess that, yeah, that, that, that was the biggest change for me. I actually wanted to, to, to be able to say that this is what I'm doing, not this is the firm and I'm sort of just a small cog somewhere in that wheel um, that, that keeps on turning and the wheels turn whether you're there or not. Um, so I, I wanted to perhaps if, if, I, if I think about it now, probably make have a different impact from what you could do in a corporate like that. So it was, I think, not to say that I didn't enjoy it. It was nice and you learned a lot. Um, you just realize at some point that you want something different. No, I mean, that, that gives us a good explanation. Uh, you've also touched on it a little bit earlier, but what's one piece of advice you would give your younger self? Um, that's a difficult one. <laughs> Take some time if you need to. It doesn't have to I think there's, there's not, well, I guess the, the one thing is you, if you learn, you are going to make mistakes. Some things that you do will work, some things won't, some things take long. Um, So what I've actually realized in speaking to some people who either want to start a practice or go into academia or anything like that. So those are typically the people that would approach me is um, before you, let's say, start teaching the master's class, you have to teach first year, second year, third year honors. Um, You can't just start at the top. And throughout, you keep on learning. You make all kinds of mistakes. You, um, that's just the way the way you learn. So I think you have to be, you have to make peace with the fact that you're not going to be doing everything exactly as you want to from the beginning. That's part of building anything, whether you're building a career in academia, whether you're building a business. Um, and I think what what I think a lot of people don't seem to appreciate or not necessarily realize is that everything takes time to build a business. It takes four or five years to, to build a new business that you try to put on top of, of what you've got takes four or five years. That's just the way it works or longer. Um, so I think 
probably the younger me was slightly more impatient than than the older me. <laughs> These things take time. Definitely, definitely. I, I, I can definitely agree. It's not going to come immediately. You have to put in the effort and be consistent. I'm looking yeah, at the comments and you can there still fail. Even, even, if yes. Yes. even if you take time, you can still fail. It, that's just the way it is. Um, but you have to take something from that. You need to learn what works, what doesn't work, why doesn't it not, why would it not work, those kind of things. You, so you have to be able to stand back a bit and not be too critical on yourself. Don't be afraid to make mistakes because you're going to make mistakes. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at the comments and the people are just commenting that they're watching. Nobody's come through with any questions. So I'm going to uh, just check from your side is, do you have, are there any last few words from you or anything that we didn't discuss that you'd like the audience to know? Um, no, not really. Um, I think that that's basically me in a nutshell. I've got a few things that I'm busy with, but it's, as I say, it's again, taking time, building up may work, may not work. We'll see. <laughs> okay, great. A reminder to the audience that the show is live on YouTube and will be available on podcast tomorrow morning. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast and you feel that it's added value to you, don't forget to like, subscribe, and click on the notification bell so that you get automatically notified when the next episode comes out. Peter, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Vais, and thanks for inviting me. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for another episode of Two Ways to Skin a